Good morning, or now uh, slightly afternoon. Thank you for joining us for an INSA Take 30 with the Data Scientist. This is a special edition that we're doing, uh, co-hosted by uh, my friend Mike Ashmore from Precisely. So glad to have him here. We're going to take an industry deep dive today into banking. So we'll be talking about where the banking industry is using advanced analytics and data science. Um, we're going to learn about data science as a service and how that can help some of the smaller banks be competitive in the same way that the larger ones are when it comes to AI. And then uh, we'll talk about data enrichment and the value of that for machine learning. And Mike will share some of uh, Precisely's uh, background and, and how they're so successful. Um, and we'll talk about a rapid viability assessment, a quick and easy way to get started and, and um, evaluate some AI use cases. So real quick, before we jump into content, I just wanted to um, introduce who Ironside is. We're a data and analytics consulting firm. We have over 20 years of experience in end-to-end -end data capabilities. Uh, really, we have three areas um, where we offer advisory services, design, build, and deploy. And that is with um, data warehousing, cloud and on-prem, <clears throat> with dashboards and reporting, and then with data science. And I um, forgot to introduce myself in the last slide, but I am Pam Asker. I'm the director of our data science practice. So we also have um, governance and managed service capabilities as well. So that's Ironside. Um, like I said, today we're going to talk about AI <clears throat> in banking. And before I jump into that, I often like to just uh, take a moment to level set. There's a lot of terminology out there. There's predictive analytics, machine learning, data science, AI, advanced analytics, data mining, right? And this gets to be um, a little bit of noise. And it's kind of like big data where we know what that means, but then we kind of don't know what it means. And we all probably have different definitions of what that means. Um, and these terms tend to, to be the same way. And the reality is it doesn't really matter. So I don't want you listening to it and focusing on why I use machine learning one, one point and uh, predictive analytics another, because I have a tendency to, to switch up what I use. The reality is if we're talking about any of these terms, we are talking about roughly the same thing, right? We're talking about a move away from traditional business analytics. We're talking about using more sophisticated uh, analytics to provide deeper insight. And so that's what's important. So I think we can say we're all kind of talking about the same thing with these terms. So um, we're doing this focus uh, and spotlight on banking because it is one of the areas where AI adoption is growing the fastest. Um, if you look at this survey here, this is from O'Reilly um, on AI enterprise, uh, AI adoption in the enterprise. And this question was asking about just what industry the respondents came from. And these respondents are across the board everywhere from um, early AI adoption <clears throat> to implementing some of it to actually being uh, very mature and having a lot of assets out there. And so you see finance and banking there as number two. Uh, it really is an area where people are aware of it, they're using it, or they're looking to use it, or they're, they're on track to, to adopt it in their enterprise. And there's a lot of consensus that in banking, things need to change, right? That the things that made you competitive before are not the things that make you competitive in the future. And that's why there's this, this focus and this drive to AI adoption in banking, right? Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons it's growing so much there is because it's data rich. And then you have millions of decisions being made uh, every day on that data, right? And so that gives you the ability to uh, perform what's called um, decision optimization, a great application of AI, right? You've got all this data, you can use that to drive all the millions of decisions. It leads to um, very lucrative application of AI. And so when I say that it's data rich and you have this ability uh, and you have all these decisions, that means if you look at this first bubble here, the use and monetization of data, that's why that's so important. Um, it's listed as one of the, the things that will make bankers the leaders in the future, banks who take advantage and they optimize and um, take advantage of the data that they have there. So it's a very valuable asset. Um, second is mass personalization. Customers are demanding more personalization. We want what we want right in front of us, offered when we're ready to accept it, right? And the ability to offer something customized and personalized in mass form um, seems impossible. That's where machine learning and AI, again, uh, is very good. And then that can also lead to those personalized interactions um, that can expedite processes like applications and customers just looking for information. So this is kind of the, the future of banking, right? Monetize your data, look to mass personalization, 
look to, to have AI-led uh, applications that expedite interactions and um, uh, processes with customers, right? And so um, that's what's driving the banking industry towards machine learning and AI. So here I have a few examples of how the banking industry is doing that. And these are the big banks, right? These are great examples of success stories. They sometimes, when we talk about, um, you know, the, the big companies, it feels a little daunting. It's at first really exciting, like, wow, look at the, the success that they're having. But then it's also a little bit like, you know, that, that's unachievable. Um, it feels that way at first. And so we'll talk about how uh, smaller banks have actual, um, actually have some parallel success stories to this. So let's look first at Wells Fargo. Um, they use chatbots, right, to, to provide that personalized um, customer service. So customers can um, get answers, they get accurate answers. Chatbots are, are more accurate than people sometimes think that they might be. They're accurate, they're fast, they, they are personalized um, and they get them what they want and they can go on their way. Uh, that's gonna lead to customer retention and increased revenue. Chatbots are one of those things that are like, well, that's great, that's a, a great application of AI, but it's not a low hanging fruit, right? Um, the Citibank example we have here, this is, um, they're using Citibank, they're using AI to combat fraud. Um, Fraud is also across the board, one of those areas that AI goes hand in hand with. It's very good at that because if you think about the amount of data, the amount of transactions that you'd have to process, not just to find something, but to find something that happens very rarely, right? It's a needle in a haystack and that's where you can leverage the power of machine learning. And it's extremely lucrative to do that and get that in place. Um, a recent study estimated that for every $1 of fraud, the institution's costs have to increase by $2.92 uh, to make up for it. So this for every $1 of fraud. So very valuable to be able to identify uh, and prevent and combat fraud. And then JP Morgan, this is kind of a, a more creative use uh, an application of machine learning. I think of it as creative because people wanna hear about the chatbots, right? And then the self-driving cars and the image detection. This is a little bit more maybe boring because what they're doing is just using it to classify um, documentation, right, and and report on it, which is kind of, you know, the, the background, the back end kind of stuff, but it's actually extremely lucrative. If you think about the ability to train a, um, an algorithm to identify a document, what the document is, the content in it, is there any risk in it that, that should be flagged, um, where to store it, when to bring it up, you know, and how to use it, that uh, drastically reduces costs reduces time and effort and leads to faster approvals um, and better governance. So three successful and really um, valuable use cases that we see from the big banks. Again, though, for smaller banks and mid-sized companies, it's a little bit daunting. How do I even get started? I can't compete in that way. These companies have teams of data scientists. They have ML ops teams. They have um, all the technology you know, all the, the machine learning technology that's out there, right? But we see that smaller banks are able to compete in the same way. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how, but first let's look at some of the, their success stories that are parallel. Um, there's a small community bank in Arkansas that also wanted to provide personalized service, not necessarily a chatbot. But what they did was they used machine learning to identify which prospects were most suitable for certain products. Because when you want to offer um, a product or, or deliver a marketing campaign, you can deliver it to the entire market, right? Or you can identify and target who actually wants this product and who wants it right now, put it in front of them right there, and you'll have more likely um, success. They actually had an 89% acceptance rate, which is uh, quite astonishing. Uh, this example from um, a mid-sized bank was able to uh, lower risk and reduce cost by using AI, uh, again, to combat fraud. So they looked um, to prevent ransomware. Um, and they said, if you don't have something like this implemented, you probably should, was a quote from them, uh, significant savings just by being able to, to prevent some ransomware attacks. Uh, and this last one here, kind of similar to the, the document processing and, and classification, they use AI to monitor and manage their community development uh, financial institution status, right? So they, uh, to be compliant, need to have 60% of their mortgages offered to low-income individuals or people buying homes in low-income areas. So 
by using AI for this, they were able to um, offer 30% 30, 30 more mortgages to low-income individuals compared to the prior year. So use it to keep themselves compliant. So great um, applications kind of parallel to what the big banks are doing. But how are they doing this? Because these smaller banks are not going out and again, buying, uh, hiring a team of data scientists and investing in all the technology um, and, and throwing resources at it, right? Uh, what they're doing is actually looking for partners who can help them, who can help them get over some of the challenges. So these are the challenges, and this, again, is not specific to banking, but across the board, these are the top challenges that organizations cite for, um, that are holding them back from further AI adoption. Um, what this comes down to is people, data, and infrastructure, right? And um, the, the top two, I always find it interesting that they're not actually technical, just not understanding the need for AI and not understanding what the use cases are. And I would say those go hand in hand because if you don't understand the value, you don't know what the use cases are, you don't know how to extract that. Um, and lacking skilled people, right? You don't have the data scientists, lack of data or data quality issues, lack of technology. So these are things that all organizations face as they, they move into AI adoption and smaller and mid-sized companies um, really struggle to, uh, to be able to in invest what they need to overcome these hurdles. So as I said, what they're doing is turning to partners. Um, you may not have the technology and the people and the expertise, but um, you know, your partners do. And uh, Ironside is actually one of those partners that can offer data science as a service. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how we do it, right? So we do have a team of data scientists, data engineers, solution architects, experienced designers. Um, and that you don't have to hire full-time perpetually, but right, you, you pay for what you use. Um, we have the, the tech stack and we have the expertise to help you through this. And so essentially that's what data science as a service is. It's the lease option. So we can deliver that expertise for you so that you can compete in the same way and have those same success stories. Um, how we deliver this is in progressive modules because this is all about de-risking the process for you uh, and protecting your investment, right? So we take it a step at a time. You can engage in a use case discovery session where we extract you know, what are all the use cases that are right for, for you to help you solve your business problems today and catalog those and identify which data you need for them. Um, rapid viability assessment. This is a two or three week um, engagement to take a use case and dig into it and say, okay, here's the data we have. Let's profile the, the quality, the quantity. Um, let's see if there's signal in there. Let's see if this is even worth moving into machine learning. And then you can build the machine learning algorithm, right? That's kind of the, the key point uh, in that module to that middle module. After you've built that and trained it and, and fed it all the data and two hyperparameters, right? You have an algorithm. If that's really showing to have the, the accuracy that you need, you can move into AI implementation, which is really where you put it into the business. So now it's maybe it's automating decisions. Maybe it's... Um, providing risk scores, maybe it's uh, batch scoring about prospects and who you should send certain offers to, right? It's, it's now implemented and driving business decisions every day. And then there's performance monitoring, right? We'll keep an eye on that model, make sure it's not drifting in its accuracy, make sure there's no um, changes to, to its performance. Now our clients find this valuable to kind of offload this to us, work hand in hand to um, deliver these AI success stories, right? Sometimes, as they move through the process, they realize this is actually proven out very valuable and they're able to invest on themselves. Um, so we keep this very transparent, transportable, the IP is yours so that we can shift it over to our clients. Because again, the goal is not to black box anything, it's to de-risk your AI adoption and your AI success story, right? And to get you there. Um, so that's how we deliver um, data science as a service uh, and help and the, the smaller and mid-sized companies compete in the same way and have those uh, AI success stories without having to uh, have the whole data science team like the big ones do. And we talked about how we solve the people issue and how we solve the technology issue. What we haven't talked about is how we solve the data issue. And with smaller companies, um, what I hear very frequently is we don't have big data, so we're not ready for AI. Or um, you know, our data is a mess. We're about two years away from being ready for advanced analytics, so we can't do it. And both of those are myths and, and we can debunk them and um, discover if your data is actually ready for machine learning. And most of the time, I think people overestimate their, their data problems. So if we look at this 
um, icon in the middle and we think about this as a, a flat file, for example, where each row is um, a customer and each column is maybe um, information about that customer or their transactions or their products that they, they have in your service, right? So when we talk about needing more data, right, and, and do we have enough data to do this, there's two dimensions here we can look at. We can look at going down, um, which means you need more examples of customers, right? Um, and you do, you, you can't build a machine learning algorithm with three or 10 or maybe a hundred, but you may not need a million, right? You, you get to a certain point where more and more and more examples are not gonna help you um, build more accurate models. It's not gonna improve the performance at all, right? You need enough examples so you can detect the signal. Um, but at some point uh, it flattens out and it flattens out much earlier than I think most people think it is, right? You, you can't just throw another million at it and expect your model to be more um, accurate. But there is the other dimension here, right? Adding more data elements. This is where we get the biggest bang for the buck with data. Uh, I don't necessarily need more counts of the same things. I need new information to add to this because when you're teaching and training a machine learning algorithm, you know, it's like teaching someone a new topic. If you only give them this much content, they're going to learn this much content. If you give them more information and more books and more exposure, they can really become experts on it. And that's what we want. We want our machine learning models to be experts. We want them to understand um, where our customers are in life and, you know, that their home is aging and they're ready for a loan or um, that their kids are going to college and they need um, to look at loans for, for school. Uh, we want to know what drives their, their decisions. We want to be able to provide uh, services and products to them at the point in their life when they're ready for them. So, so you can add more and more information. That's where external third-party data can come in and be very valuable. <laughs> so we've partnered with Precisely. We've worked with them for a while uh, for several reasons. One, um, they really are the global leader in data integrity, right? So they've, they've really mastered the, the cleaning and um, verifying of data. They have products and tools that help with that enrichment process, right? Joining data sets to um, addresses. And they have an extensive catalog uh, of data. So I put a few um, here on the, the left side that I work with quite frequently. We've got demographics data. We've got points of interest, boundaries, crime index, property attributes. You can think about how um, adding any of those to the data that you already have on your customers could give you more information and therefore give it any kind of machine learning model more information and thus make it more accurate. So this is just um, a screenshot of some of the data and I just wanna give a couple examples. So one of the things that I use very frequently is the, the demographics. So you can get that down to the level of um, you know, income levels and age distributions and things like that. Oh, sorry. But you can also get this, um, this cameo, this segmentation. So the, the little blocks in there, if you scroll in, it gets pretty precise down to the block, tells you that segment of population. And if you see on the left side where it says cameo USA, the, the designation, that, um, that segment, if I was hovering over one of those tiny little dots, the, the segment is called prosperous families, urban movers and shakers, right? And so I could go and look that up and say, what does that mean? Who are those people that live in that little area? Are those people that are going to be um, my customers, right? And then you can find them elsewhere. Um, so that's that's really helpful in understanding the, the, um, the distribution, the, the neighborhoods. Uh, the other thing over there is points of interest. So I've clicked on restaurants, I think, so you can see all the purple dots where restaurants are. So think about where do I want to put branches and where are my customers living and, and do they have access to, um, to our services? So um, <clears throat> just in thinking of the context of data enrichment, I wanted to go back to a couple of those, um, some of those use cases. So we've talked about personalized marketing and offering uh, uh, an offer, not just to the entire market, but targeting it to who wants it right now. And so if you think about maybe um, sending offers for home improvement loans to customers and prospects, you wanna know who's most likely to be ready for a home improvement loan right now. Um, you know, my, my roof is um, not the greatest and the paint's peeling on my house and you know, that might be appealing to me right now, right? How would you know that? Well, if you think about the, the data that I just talked about and, and showed you, um, 
you know, if we had property attributes of our customer's home, we understood the age of the home, the age of the roof, condition of the roof, um, you know, does it have a pool, all these different um, attributes that can help us uh, differentiate when somebody's kind of getting to that point where their home needs improvement. And if we think about the, the neighborhoods and the demographic area, um, this is very common in the Boston area where you have very old buildings and homes, right? But uh, you know, every 10 or 20 years, it's like one area becomes the hotspot for young families to move into, or you know, the upper up and coming neighborhoods where you take those old homes and everybody flips them or or does home renovations and improves them, right? So find those areas, um, you know, and your customers that are in those areas surrounded by that, and those are probably going to be good targets for those. So again, machine learning can help with that. But this, the external data that you don't have in your transactional database can be very powerful to help you kind of link those together and identify your customers and be able to provide what they're looking for at the time they're looking for it. And another very common um, application of location intelligence data would be uh, site selection, right? So you can do this without even machine learning, sometimes just looking at, you know, what's where and, and um, you know, do I want to be in this kind of neighborhood or this kind of neighborhood, but machine learning can, can also uh, optimize that. So bringing the two together can be a fantastic way to make sure that you're putting branches in areas that optimize um, distance to the communities that you serve, distance to customers with the highest lifetime value, um, not cannibalizing another branch's uh, business, for example. You can bring in data on school boundaries, demographics, um, points of interest, the neighborhood boundaries. So again, another fantastic application um, of location intelligence and enhancing uh, machine learning. And just um, to put this in some context too, these are not exactly banking examples, but just um, to give some specific figures on the enhancement with location data, um, on the left here, this example was to predict damage to utility lines at dig sites. So uh, machine learning was able to accurately detect where damage was likely to happen. But then when you added uh, information like the, the property attributes and the zoning, uh, it improved it by 25% more. So they were able to find 25% more of those damages with that extra data. That's significant savings and um, reduced risk. And on the left, very similar, 27% um, improvement in the ability of machine learning to find uh, high loss claims um, when you added information about the, the claimants and the area uh, that the incident occurred in. And I wanted to also point out that it's valuable to add the data in and get more accurate predictions, of course. But you can also then identify what are the drivers of the model, which, which features that we put in are having the biggest impact. And when you're working with someone like Precisely that has a vast amount of data, this is a great way to isolate down to what do I actually want to invest in when it comes to data? What do I want to store and govern and, and update, right? So you can limit uh, that and just utilize what's really going to help boost your model and get you the, um, the ROI that you're looking for. And so from here, I want to turn this over to um, Mike to tell us a little bit more about Precisely. Thanks, Pam, and uh, um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my, I'm Mike Ashmore, and I am uh, from Precisely. And that's a brand that you may not have heard of before. We are a new brand. In fact, we rebranded our company uh, 12 months ago, and we're the coming together of a number of uh, large companies in the data space, the data integration space, the data quality space, and the data enrichment space. Um, and one of our particular specialities that's very distinguishing is our understanding of location intelligence. Uh, so that's data and the tools associated with data where location is important. And that really is very informative because people live places and uh, things happen in places and money is spent in places and understanding the place and the context of the place uh, delivers that additional insight uh, through enrichment that um, is otherwise unavailable. Um, you may know some of the brands in our business. Uh, we were formerly SyncSort, we were formerly Pitney Bowes Software, and there's many um, household brand names, um, well, maybe not household, but certainly business brand, brand names 
under the covers. And we've got the great privilege of serving an awful lot of clients around the world. My particular role um, with the company is that I run everything to do with addressing. And address is really central to a lot of what uh, we've been talking about today because um, people live places, people work in places, and the address serves as an anchor point to which a lot of additional information can get placed. And therefore, using an address as the anchor to, uh, uh, for enrichment is really key and differentiated. Whereas a lot of companies struggle with dealing with addresses because an address is a complex structure. It's a multi-field label that can change rapidly and can be expressed in lots of challenging different ways. We are the, the company in there that the other big brands um, come to trust. You know, our, our clientele in that space um, is, is in the region of like 45 of the largest uh, 50 insurance companies in the United States. It's um, the Freddie Macs and Fannie Mae's in the in, in the mortgage space. It's um, all of the large telecommunications companies, um, and I, you know, it's all all the big credit card issuers. Uh, or sorry, the the big credit card um, um, companies like Mastercard and Visa. So we've got a great deal of pedigree understanding addresses on a global basis. Um, and so I think it's worthwhile talking about how we go about enriching data to provide insight to the models that Pam's uh, been talking about here. Our whole process is essentially to clean, standardize, and validate um, addresses that you store. One of the key things there is about how do you take that um, inconsistently expressed address information, the misfielded information, poorly spelt information, information in the address lines that may have changed over time as street names change. Um, and, and there's a surprisingly large number of street, change ch street name changes. And get that so that we're able to know what we're talking about. Our process, once we've cleaned it, is to add additional information. We, we really add two things uh, to take an address and operationalize it in people's business, getting it ready for enrichment. That first step is to geocode it. So we're putting a latitude and longitude. And remember, I just said that one of the key things here is adding location because location delivers a great deal of insight. So we add the location. The other thing we do is add a unique identifier. We call it the precisely ID. Um, this ID is unique for every address at the lowest level. So every unit in every uh, you know, apartment block, every business unit, will have its own unique identifier. It's persistent, meaning that from version to version of our product, it stays the same. It's also persistent in that when the address changes, and please know that I say when, not if, when an address changes, um, you know, the zip code changes or uh, the street name changes, we even see house number changes. When things change, but it's meant to be the same thing, we keep it the same from uh, w when that change happens. And so that delivers a great deal of integrity to, uh, to, to the enrichment process and, and the data. And by the way, men, many of you on this call may already be using uh, some of the tools that um, produce uh, this precisely ID um, today in, in different parts of your business. We use that precisely ID then to enrich uh, as we call it, our data with our reference data. And Pam's already alluded to some of the reference data we've got available, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, but we're using that uh, precisely ID uh, to join with data that we've got in the portfolio that's already got a precisely ID on it. Um, now, we allow our customers also, we provide the ability for our customers to also use that precisely ID to connect the address to lots of different pieces of information. Um, but many other people also just use the locational component to connect. So they're doing um, location-based analysis on the data to say, okay, I'm going to in inherit uh, this. Like a, a good example there might be to measure the distance uh, that a house may be from the coastline uh, because we find that um, houses uh, within 10 miles of um, a sea coast. Um, require more maintenance than houses that um, are 
further away. And so that might be an indicator and, and a, a useful uh, capability within the um, uh, using location analysis as a data preparation tool that then goes into your machine learning model. So let me talk for a second about some of the um, data that we've got available. Pam did talk about some examples and, uh, and um, trust me, going into this um, detail would, would be another hour long presentation. So I'm not going to <coughs> uh, consume you with all of that. Let me just say that um, at the center of all of these data products is the precise ID because we're able to take, connect an address that you're storing with all of these different types of data. So um, right at the top, I put consumer insights data. And here's a small selection of what we brand consumer insights. We're talking about people's purchasing power, their lifestyles, their shopping habits, and so on. Um, we then got a lot of property data. Um, so this is what the mortgage industry and the, um, the telecommunications industry um, and uh, like to focus on the insurance industry because it's very property centric. Uh, they, we've then got a large focus on demographic data and Pam's already uh, looked, talked about some of the demographic insights that we're able to uh, draw out. There's also a need for um, boundary based data and I, and I guarantee people, everyone on this call will have been impacted by our boundaries and the use of those boundaries. Um, everything from um, when you're looking in Zillow and Zillow knows what, what neighborhood you're in or or to Twitter happen to knowing what you what um, whereabouts you are, so that they can send you location centric tweets. That's that that's our data uh, behind the scenes driving that. Another area of interest could be to understand businesses, um, e either uh, the individual attributes of all kinds of businesses, or getting in specific businesses where retail areas happening and, and this impacts people, people's loans, it impacts um, uh, uh, the risk of doing certain business. We, we've got an enormous number of clients that actually focus on, um, on um, understanding if, uh, if there are high risk businesses right next to homes that um, are looking for, you know, and I love the idea of a, a loan, you know, understanding how much you're going to loan someone when they're actually next to a business that's uh, rather toxic. Um, and then, of course, we've got to visualize that information and to be able to derive um, visual insights. We, we provide essentially mapping style data to, uh, to, to, um, to put context to a visual image there. Um, if, if I look at the individual precisely ID and look at my own portfolio of data and how many attributes that can be used um, in, a, in a model to understand behaviors, it's in the order of up to, because obviously it's not gonna be everything, but up to 9,300 individual attributes for every single address in the country. And with that, let me hand back to you, Pam. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, really, um, really powerful to see how much data is there. And um, it's been really fun for me to, to bring it in and enrich all these different data sets. And um, you mentioned businesses and, and small, small business loans is another uh, area that would be ripe for that too, and that personalized um, offering. Um, so I'm gonna go into summarizing some things and then also um, answering some questions in a little bit. So please, if you have questions um, while I, I deliver the next couple of slides, you can chat them. Uh, you can just type them up in the chat window and then we'll get to that and spend a little time answering your questions that you may have on AI and banking or data enrichment um, or anything else you don't wanna chat about. Happy to. So the one thing that I wanted to get back to our data science as a service offering and just put this up here about the rapid viability assessment, a little more information about it um, and how you can um, get a hold of us if you wanted to learn more. So as I said, it's a two to three week assessment, right? And it's when we take one specific use case and really dig into it and make sure that it's viable and see what what's the potential that you could get out of this. It, this is especially valuable for organizations that are, are really new to AI and haven't tested the waters yet or ones that you know really don't have the the ability to invest really heavily long term right so so a small package to take that use case profile the data first of all uh right so we have the profiler that can just spit out a, a dashboard about 
the data quality and its quantity. And then we look a little more closely and make it very specific to the use case. Let's look at the target, which is usually what you're trying to predict. Is this person going to accept a campaign offer? Is this location right for uh, a new branch? Um, is this um, you know, account fraudulent or is this activity fraudulent, we see? So, so you want to identify, uh, can we capture that thing that we want to predict? Is it there? Is it there in enough quantity? What does it look like? So visualize that and profile it. And then pull out some key features that make sure that there's some signal in there. You know, do you have the, the data points in there that um, could help you predict that? And at the same time, in some cases, we can also use this, um, uh, this small package to evaluate some of that third-party data and to identify, you know, you have this data, you, you, you know, it's got some signal, but it's missing some, some information that could be really helpful to, to predict this case. And so, you know, here's some precisely data that could help. And so we can start to look at what would be the potential ROI of, of um, enriching this with precisely data. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is build a machine learning model with just your data and then build one with the precisely data added and look at those metrics, like when I showed 25% more damage is detected. That's what you want to know. If I add this data in, how much more lift am I going to get? And what does that actually um, result in, in terms of dollars, right? And so where does that get me? And so, so this is a small package that can get us um, started on that, understanding if the use case is viable, understanding if um, third-party data is worth looking at and uh, considering enriching. So if you're interested in learning more about that, there's the here to help um, at Ironside Group at the bottom or where you went to to register for this, um, you can find more information about how to how to set up um, uh, a meeting. We can chat about that. So taking a step back for a minute, um, we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about how machine learning and AI is being adopted everywhere in banking right now. Um, banking is very data rich. It's very um, transaction and decision rich. Um, so that makes it a great uh, opportunity for machine learning to be valuable. The big banks are really taking advantage of this. They're killing it. Um, but the, the smaller banks are smart, right? They're, they're understanding the value of leasing AI. So, you know, it, your competitors and, and other banks your size are looking at this too. They're not sitting back saying, well, I don't have uh, enough data or that's for the, the big banks to, to use AI, right? There are opportunities to partner up, get some help on that, people who have the resources and, and the expertise there. So data science as a service can be that, that way to, um, to get you past all those barriers that we talked about with people, even with data uh, and with technology. Uh, and we talked about how big data is not necessary, right? Um, and so you can look to external data, um, data providers like Precisely who are leaders in the industry to come in and supplement some of that data. Um, and it Precisely also makes that process much easier. You can go out and get free data, but um, managing that and trying to bring that in and join it to messy address data can be very, very challenging. So um, definitely going to get more bang for your buck with the same amount of data going through something like uh, something like Precisely. So let me pause there. I appreciate you um, taking that time to hear all of that, and I'd love to hear what your questions are. Um, I think you may also be able to even take yourself off mute and ask a question, uh, or you can type that up in the chat window and um, or either Mike or I. Love to answer your questions. Pam, um, we we do have a couple questions, and then we did have a couple questions at an earlier session that we can carry over as well. Um, so the the first one I'm going to ask is sort of that carryover question, and um, this one will be for Mike. Mike, how well are you typically able to match our bank's data with the Precisely data? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the key to that is, it, well, there's two parts to that question. The, um, the first part is how well do we um, match the addresses that are stored at the bank with with our product, our reference data, and be able to assign that unique ID to it? And the answer obviously depends on the quality of the data that is stored at the bank. And we see a complete range. Um, when, we're, when we're working with pristine data, it's well above 99%. And so um, companies that are using um, some form of um, 
ad automated address entry where clients are selecting their address from a type ahead service which of course we also provide um, then uh, then then it's usually 99 plus percent um, I've seen it also um, in the 80 85 to 90 percent range when what we start doing is we're seeing very old data data addresses that have been poorly fielded um, lots of spelling mistakes hand typed essentially uh, data and what you get there um, is garbage and also addresses that no longer exist so there, there's a lot of gone aways um, that exists there. So it, it's obviously a range um, that, that we're seeing, but primarily, if, if I were to give the average, we're talking about 94, 95% if I look at an average across uh, my business. And by the way, match rate at that particular part, because I run everything addressing, match rate there is critical to us. And so that's why I actually know those numbers. Um, the second part of it is then how well do we um, are we able to enrich the data? And that, again, is extraordinarily high because we've taken the unique ID um, approach to it. Now, our unique ID is on an address. It's not about location. So being able to connect accurately with IDs in the, in the enrichment data um, is extremely easy and, um, and, and you know, provided that we've been able to append an ID also to the enrichment data. That's a hundred percent. So, so the, the the question becomes on what's the process to enrich the to, to to put the ID on the enrichment data, and that becomes a question of what kind of enrichment data is it? If it's demographics and it's about an area, that's extremely high. If it's about connecting it with other data, and like if it's individual person data, and we start saying, oh, we want to figure out people's email addresses, uh, for instance, the the source data that we've got there isn't obviously as such great coverage as as say all the houses that we've got or all the property information that we have because it's just people are more more cautious about letting that information out and so it becomes about a fill rate on that reference data i hope that answers uh will go some way to answer the question yes thanks mike um, this next question is for you pam um if we want to get started how do we identify the best application of data science? The best application, um, well, that, that could mean two things. If it's technology, um, you know, we're tool agnostic and we've used a lot. So I've, um, it's actually one of the great things about being in consulting, um, get my hands on a lot of the different technology and get to um, test drive them. Um, you know, our data science as a service platform, we built on AWS for a few reasons. One is that it's um, uh, pay as you go, right? So it's cloud, it's scalable, and it's not a big capital expense for, for us internally or for the clients. Um, it also keeps things pretty transparent. So in the end, you're writing Python code. And, you know, if a client wants that IP and wants to put it on their own infrastructure, it's easier to help them do that. Um, so, so we use uh, AWS for a number of reasons, but uh, we, you know, we've also used uh, many various other platforms. We use um, IBM Watson Studio and SPSS, and Data Robot, Alteryx. So, um, you know, we help organizations do vendor selections and see what's right for them. Um, we do that frequently too. Uh, if by application, that could also mean um, use case. And again, that can be really tricky um, to know what use case to start in. My concern sometimes is that people look at what data do I have and what problems can I solve with that data? And sometimes you end up solving a problem that doesn't get you anywhere, nobody really wants it, doesn't get adopted, and then all the enthusiasm for AI kind of windows away. Um, we do have a use case um, discovery engagement where we will work with um, all of the different functional areas to understand what are your business goals and challenges, right? What are the decisions that make the, that, that get you to those goals? What information do you need? You know, and if we were to build a model, what data do we need? And that's where we eventually get to what data do you have and where can we get something else to supplement it if necessary, right? And so that gets you to use cases that are prioritized both on their business value and on the data that can support them and making them actually viable. So, um, so you wanna think about both, not just solving problems that you happen to have data to solve. Hopefully that, that answers that. I wasn't sure by application, um, probably the technology side. But. 
Yeah, no, you answer, answered both, so that's great. Um, the next question is, what if our data is not in a centralized data warehouse? Can we still get started? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the biggest chunk of time for data scientists is not actually training the model itself. It's doing all the, the ETL and data preparation, and a big part of that is data sourcing. So data scientists are very comfortable pulling data from a lot of different sources and matching it and massaging it, right? Um, to get started, especially in RVA, where it's a, a very short engagement, it's, um, you know, there's a lot to do in that time. What we often do in that case is take data extracts from different sources, right? So that this way we, we can pull flat files out and we can test, is there a signal there? Is, is this use case viable? Is it going to get you the ROI that you need before you worry about like, oh, I need to build the central data warehouse, right? Um, and even if you did want to build it and deploy it, there are ways to build channels from various different sources into uh, the AI application. So, so you wouldn't need to say, oh, I need to, you know, I'm two years away from doing data science because, you know, we don't have a data warehouse, we're going to build that, and that's on the books. You can certainly circumvent that um, and get started. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, could you compare your approach with Ascend AI with a FinTech AI solution? Yeah, so as I said, banking is one of those areas uh, where AI is taking off because it's data rich uh, and there's a lot of use cases um, that can benefit from it. And so there is the industry of FinTech that is identifying those use cases and building some solutions for them. Um, so oftentimes these are turnkey solutions designed for a specific use case Right. And, um, uh, you know, if it's like loan applicant risk um, and underwriting, for example, there may be a fintech solution for that. Um, that's great. I'm actually all for uh, not recreating the wheel. If there's a tool out there that can do it, that's great. My only cautions with that, and I also want to distinguish it from what data science as a service is, is that those are often a black box, right? Um, so if you need to know the drivers of the model and you need to have some transparency and even control over them, it's not going to be the way to go. There are use cases where it doesn't really matter, right? You, you know, you're putting your data in, you're getting your prediction out, and it's okay that it's a black box and that's fine. But it's good to know that. Um, but it's also designed probably for, for one use case, right? It's specialized in doing that one thing. Whereas data science as a service is saying, you know, if, if your organization is ready for AI adoption, there may be many use cases that you want to build long term. There may be different functional areas. And so part of what we do is build a scalable feature store on Snowflake, right? So we bring the data in. <clears throat> As we start to extract features, we're storing them and cataloging them. So your next use case um, can leverage that same data and leverage those, um, those same features. And there's actually a whole another webinar I've given on our process for doing this um, because it's so important to build this and to limit the, the technical debt so that you can scale long term. But that's different from uh, a turnkey solution, right? Because that's going to solve one problem. It's going to it's a specific hammer for a specific nail versus you know building a customized solution with your data, um, making it specific to you and your relationship and your customers, um, and also making that scalable so that you can have an enterprise AI and have uh, multiple use cases and feeding from the same feature store and, and uh, reducing technical debt. So it's a little bit more of service versus a tool. Thanks, Pam. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mike, this next question, I think you touched on, but maybe if you could just add a couple more words on it. They asked um, precisely ID. How did you implement that? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that that is a great question. We get that all the time. In fact, I remember speaking with uh, well, multi a multitude of uh, clients. You know, when you when you get into folks that have been delving deep into addresses for the last ten or fifteen years, um, I, rem I me remember Verizon t telling me it was impossible to do because they'd spent eight years trying to do it. Um, uh, look, the reality is the details of the how. Is based is is our Coca Cola recipe. It's our eleven herbs and spices. You know, um, it's really hard. Um, we've been working in the field of addresses. You know, for through our legacy companies for the last, quite frankly, forty years. 
um, uh, what we are able to do is um, use that knowledge and insight that we've gained over those years to truly understand all the different views on which you can look at an address. If you're looking at an address and thinking it's something simple, that it's not going to change, it's stable and is a regularized structure and universal across the country, or especially the world, then the answer is no. There, the, the way that addresses are created is frequently, um, quite frankly, insane. Um, and uh, we, would, we would never do it if you were redesigning uh, the world but we are where we are. So, so the idea was, is essentially that we assign the ID and we have thousands of algorithms that validate the ID and the, and, and the fact, you know, checking whether an address is changing. Um, we're looking at multiple different reference sources. When we're actually assigning it, we actually take in 13 different sources of addresses to correlate one against another to make sure that we're not misunderstanding something. Um, actually talking to you about how we do it would be uh, probably an hour long conversation and just, just to cover the surface, but it's down to our experience. Thanks, Mike. Um, Pam, we don't have any more questions, but if you could just do me a favor and um, could you share a little bit more about the deliverables from the rapid viability assessment and the next step um, that we would love the audience to take? Sure. In fact, I can just um, go back to this. So um, I, I mentioned that we have a, a data profiler in our platform. So as we ingest raw data, it will profile that data and, and one of the um, deliverables is the outcome of that, right? Being able to understand how much data we ingested and uh, missing data is really important and, you know, get down to, to details um, like what's in there because I, I've run into this oftentimes where people say, yeah, it's 99% populated, but if it's populated with NA, which means like null, right? Uh, it doesn't show up as null, but it's one of the categories and 99% of the time it comes up, right? Those, those are the kind of details that are specific to data science that I need to know. So it's designed for that purpose. So I understand not just um, quantity and quality at a blank level, but some of the details that I need as I start to um, do the analytics. Anyway, so, so the outcome of that um, is at the deliverable, and that's really just valuable to have and to use as a guide to understand um, whether you should move on with this use case or look at others and um, and where uh, data enrichment could actually be valuable and supplement some of it. And then the other deliverable is the, the viability report. So in there, what we're doing is we're looking at things like data quality, data quantity. We're looking at the complexity of the methodology we would need to solve the problem, right? And we're looking at um, the implementation and what that would entail and the likelihood for adoption and the business value and all of these things to, to come up with. Um, uh, and the important one I forgot was, is there signal in the noise, right? Because it all comes down to the data could be really good, but if it's not related to what you're trying to predict, it's not gonna help you, right? So that's another thing that, that we wanna look at. So, so coming out of all that, we're really making a recommendation to move forward and begin the, the machine learning phase or to move to another use case. And we really want clients to understand that, um, you know, moving away is not always a failure. Sometimes there's things that come out of it, like maybe you do need to do some data governance and data cleanup, um, but you just move to the next use case, right? And all you've invested is this three weeks, right? You haven't said, oh, we're gonna build a whole uh, center of excellence for data science, and then you built the use case and it was a failure because it didn't work out, right? No. You invest, you look, is it gonna, is it worth moving forward or not? And if not, you move on to the next use case and the next use case. And that's why it's important for us to help you develop that, that catalog of use cases too, right? Because data science, it, it is risky in that you don't know what you're gonna get. Not every use case is going to be a win. You don't say, we're gonna build this warehouse and it's gonna look like this and I know what it's gonna look like at the end or this dashboard or something. It, you know, it's, um, the data is kind of in, in control. And so we want to de-risk that process, and that's um, what the rapid viability assessment is designed to do. Terrific. And I know that we're going to reach out to everyone that's attended and offer a 30-minute call with you, Pam, um, to sort of talk through their situation and to see if Send AI and the rapid viability assessment and um, enriching it with precisely data is something that could help their organization. So thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great day.
Thank you, Mike. Thank you.